Now, where was I? Oh, yes. Uh, so silly and so stupid. They would take their brain out and play with it if they had a brain. Well, it happens there was a... I, I call him the first neuroscientist in America, and his name was Elmer Gates. And he was fascinated with everything around him, and he had a, 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 a nanny, and her name was Virginia. And whenever he was playing and finding interesting things, he'd say, you know, what is this? And Virginia didn't know all the answers, but she knew who might give him the answers. And so she would take him to a college or a school. And, and if, uh, if little Elmer wanted to know why a piece of iron was rusty, uh, she would find the professor, the teacher, who knew about oxidation, and, and that professor would explain it to Elmer. Elmer grew up, as I said, to become probably United States' first neuroscientist, although he's not recognized as such, but he was interested in the brain and how we learn and how he thought we could actually build mind. He wrote, his sons wrote an autobiography, his, uh, his biography, and uh, it was called um, The Art of Mind Making or something like that. It was an inspiration to me and I named my game uh, Emeralda uh, after Elmer Gates. And in fact, I sometimes call it Elmeralda. <laughs> That's another story. Um, in fact, um, early on I was interested in neuroscientists and, and how the artist's brain uh, might be different than um, non-artist game, uh, but I found that there were many uh, elements in science and technology engineering and mathematics where the uh, uh, innovators, the inventors, uh, discoverers were very much like artists and they they played and they thought about these things and fortunately they many of them wrote them down uh, Louis Pasteur for example uh, suggested that chance favors the prepared mind in other words if you prepare yourself chances are you'll find the answer to the questions that you might be working with the point of my talks is to college students now who are generally in their mere years of 18 to 30 years old uh, get it straight. Get the history of printmaking straight. Um, give it the fact that printmaking was discovered or invented in the caves uh, alongside painting. And I represent printing with a handprint alongside the paintings. Uh, paintings representing the art, that which flowed uh, freely and directly from the human being, the mind and the spirit and the memories. And the printmaker was making handprints beside them. And so I say that the, that the, uh, the art and technology were, united, were, were, were joined at birth. So if we start printmaking lessons with that idea in mind, uh, we find that the technology and the art uh, are interdependent because we wouldn't know about the painting in the cave had it not been for the inventions that came from technology, for example, a camera to take a picture of the painting in the cave. That means that there's only one thing missing and that we don't know whether they were singing while they painted and printed. And of course, today we do have technologies for recording singing. So I suggest that printmaking should be joined with music uh, and, and the other arts, dance and all the others, uh, and, and some sort of a mix uh, so that when you're making a woodcut, uh, you might be singing or somebody else might be playing music and something like that. And that, that it, there is a true uh, kind of interchange among the three things, the art and the technologies, um, in this case, adding music to the, to the formula. Well, that's all I have for now. I'm at the top of Hummingbird Hill again, and I hope you watched me and enjoyed me. And if you get in touch with me, you can even telephone me, 206-498-9208. Uh, Thanks for watching. Bill Ritchie.